Thank you for taking your time to see me. Um, I reached out to you a few months ago, or Theo, on your behalf, um, yes. about because you are an alumni of King's College London, as indeed mm-hmm. uh, many of the readers of our publication are current or departed members of King's. And uh, you qualified, am I right in saying, with an English literature and language degree in 1998? Spot on, that's right, yeah, yes. perfect. Don't know, at least I've done the start of my research. Um, <laughs> what are your, do you mind if I ask a few questions about what your overriding memories of that time were, your time at King's? Oh, gosh. So for me, it was it was coming up to London, I think. I I, um, I grew up in Surrey, so not terribly far away, but in the quiet, um, you know, quite the far side of Surrey, if you like, northwest Surrey. Mm-hmm. So um, very much a kind of suburban upbringing. Um, and and I went to a comprehensive school as well. So when I came up to London, it, it came to King's, it was a massive change for me, both in terms of like living in a city and adjusting to living in a city, but also because the um, student body at King's was so cosmopolitan, so many overseas okay. students, um, and also lots of students from sort of um, private schools, public schools, and I hadn't really mixed with people like that before. So, uh, but also I, I got to know lots of mature students as well. So I think that's one of the real features of of King's. Um, it's probably, and I don't know how it's changed now, but at the time it probably is, wouldn't be quite accurate to call it diverse. Um, but just it, for me, just in terms of the the huge range of types of people that I would never have encountered before um from my far, my rather sort of as i say sheltered suburban upbringing yeah. um and uh that for me was was the main thing and just meeting so many different people from from different yeah. backgrounds uh different countries different walks of life different experiences that for, that, that that it's still kind of i guess my overwhelming impression of london now um although i feel i feel like i've grown into it more but certainly as an 18 year old coming from as i say quite a sheltered and um uh what's the word uh, yeah boring yeah. <laughs> a sheltered background well, I came from uh, you know, it was it was yeah. a real yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So that, uh, that, actually, was... that relates to one of my prompts that I had for one of the questions so I think coming to King's my overwhelming experience of it has been a so much more of an international perspective like you said so I was living with people mm. from um, Myanmar Romania Brazil all next to me in my first year of university and I think that helped me make less of a uh, less of an anglo-centric view of politics international yeah. relations and um do, how because do you think, I think that as well, studying the thing about changed kings you? yeah i was just gonna say the thing about kings of course is it, it's a sort of the full range of courses it's not like london school of economics or imperial or something like that where you're going to have mm-hmm. people studying quite a narrow range of subjects so i knew people who were studying maths i knew people who were studying medicine i knew people who were doing um i met quite a lot of war study students for one reason yes. or another as well as lots of people in humanities which is obviously more where i was so you know you have it's it, it, it is that you know much broader range um uh, you know so not not just nationalities and so on um yeah. sorry what did you say so just saying <laughs> are you still question. like are you still in contact with friends from your time uh, and colleagues in time here this is such a bizarre time to be asking me this question and i'll tell you why uh when i was at king's um before i'd come to uh university i was heavily into musical theater so when I came to King's, I was looking for the Musical Theatre Society to join and it didn't exist. So I joined the Gilbert and Sullivan Society instead because uh, there was always Gilbert and Sullivan Society because W.S. Gilbert was a former student at King's. So uh, it was quite a big, a big thing. Um, and I did quite a few solo roles with them. I was the president in my final year. And just last Saturday, so two days ago, there's been a big reunion of all the people who've been in the Gilbert and Sullivan Society at King's for the last 30 years. <laughs> oh, that's really nice. And so I can tell you that. So I did the Mikado uh, in the uh, in the new theatre in the Strand in uh, <laughs> February 1996. Um, yeah. you, you, I'm sure you're not remotely familiar with uh, with the Mikado, but it's got that's quite a famous song in it called... <laughs> it's got the, it's most well, one of its well-known tunes is called The Three Little Maids. So I sang that as a trio with two other women, both of whom I'm still in touch with, one of whom I drove up to the reunion with on Saturday, and I'm the godmother to her daughter. And the people I met there, I was at least five or six people that I've known all these years and I'm still in touch with. There's a couple of other people, one of my very best friends from King's. is currently in the States, but he's coming back before the end of the year. He's the godfather to my son. Uh, he was also in that production of the Mikado. Um, and yeah, so I've kept in touch with all of them over this time, you know, yeah. sort of sporadically. But I saw them all on Saturday night and we were 
Perfectly. <laughs> it's almost, you've almost so, got a family out of kings. I know, Perfect. I know. So so those are the people I'm I'm still in touch with. Um, the person who's godmother to my daughter is somebody who I was doing English with and we were later went on to share a house with and both while we were at King's and after and I still mm-hmm. see her, saw her, see her regularly and we are very much still in touch. So, so yes. Yeah, friendship. <laughs> but I just thought it's exactly. just so it was just so funny given that we'd had this big reunion on Saturday that we're actually doing this interview today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um I I understand you only had a limited amount of time, so I'd like to get to you some more questions. That's okay. Mm-hmm. Um you will sure, probably sure. be too uh too polite and reject the notion but you've been incredibly successful in what you've chosen to do you know the Lib Dem spokesperson for business energy and trade and that doesn't come from no work at all what would you encourage current King students to do outside of their course to get where they want to be in the future what advice would you offer them well absolutely to follow their passions I think I mean that's that's what took me I suppose to the Gilbert Sullivan Society in the first place and that's Mm -hmm. where I've got this incredible group of people who've been friends for 30 years because uh, that was very much my passion at the time. I wasn't especially into politics when I was at uh, at King's. It wasn't. I was always interested in current affairs. My in my second year, we had the nineteen ninety seven election, and that was obviously pretty. That was the first general Momentous. election I voted in, and that yeah. was fairly, you know, fairly seismic. And I remember take, paying a huge amount of attention to what was going on and being really, really interested. But it didn't. Uh, I didn't particularly think of politics as something that I personally could influence or be a part of. It was all something that other people were doing elsewhere. So it wasn't really until quite a bit later in life, not till I was nearly in my 40s, that politics was something I, per- I, I felt like I could personally get involved in. Um, but absolutely follow your passions, the things that you're really interested in, because, you know, they, it may be that that's a career path, um, but primarily it's a thing that um, gets you out of bed, in the mornings, you know, when nothing else will, it is a source of friendship and uh, and 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 networks and and um, you know, if it's something you can share with other people, that you know, it's it become you can develop really meaningful relationships um, and become part of a community. But also, just when nothing else happens, there's meaning and purpose to your life. Uh, people struggle a lot, I know, with poor mental health these days. But if you find something you're really passionate about that you really love doing. When everyone else and everything else fails you, you've got that. You can always yeah. go and do that. Whether it's music, it's art, it's poetry, it's literature, it's you know, it could be something completely random. But you know, follow your follow your passions. And I think yeah. Kings, being at Kings is one probably one of the best places you can do that. And unless unless your passion is kind of like remote hill walking, which is yeah. tricky to manage. Although Coast come diving. to Richmond Park, <laughs> <laughs> you know Richmond Park offers that opportunity. Uh, yeah. We have it's the it's the biggest wilderness in London, but you know there are so many opportunities, so many cultural opportunities within the college itself. I certainly found, but also beyond, um, so many opportunities to get involved in all sorts of different groups again within the college, but beyond. Um, and it's just. And I think particularly if, like me, you've come from what I would regard as a sort of fairly um, sheltered, fairly unexciting background, suddenly to be plunged into this world where there are so many options out there and all kinds of people that you just, you know, your my eyes were really opened. And that was, that's really the time, I think, when it's kind of, yeah. wow, you know, what, 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 what kind of life might I end up leading? It, it's, it's not I've quite as, as throw myself in narrow as I thought. To see. Yeah. Can, who knows what I'll enjoy to do most and it's the best time to make a, Make the most of the opportunities you get given. Um, precisely, precisely. So I just picking up on that briefly. In 2017, you told a King's magazine that you were interested in being a journalist, at least fleetingly, and then you changed your mind. What should I beware of? What What am I doing completely <laughs> wrong? What put you off? And where should I not <laughs> tread that path? Um, I think it was what what put me off was more that I got interested in doing something else rather than I decided not to become a journalist. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's um. I think there are so many more opportunities these days, actually, because don't forget back in 97, 98, we didn't have we didn't have the Internet. <laughs> it was yeah. just starting. I remember sat in the in the library in the Strand building waiting for a, a, a web page to load. And you have to sit there <laughs> for about 30 seconds for a page to load. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> so I sent my first email from the computer room on the fifth floor of the. Uh, oh, God. the What do you call it? The, the old building? Not the Strand building, but the one where the chapel is, and there's a Bush House. Bush House, Uh, King's Building. Uh, Yeah, could be the King's Building. Anyway, but you know, I'd sent my first email 
2000, loaded my first web web pages in there <laughs> at King's. That wouldn't yeah. have been until my second or third year. So all the options now right. for kind of writing and getting your work published and finding an audience, you know, just didn't exist back then. So I think mm-hmm. it probably just felt a little bit intimidating trying to break into it. Um, but uh, yeah, no, well, we I, I sort of narrowed my way into that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I'd narrowed my preferences down to sort of working in publishing and I went off and worked in book selling for a little while. Um, the oldest booksellers in the UK, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Hatchards on Piccadilly, which was wonderful, actually. Really great place to work. Really loved that. Yeah, and it's very much where my sort of my English literature degree took me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, spread your wings. Um, can I, what are you mm. proudest of in your let limit this to political career so far. What what are you what have you done since coming into politics? Maybe not since coming into parliament that you're that you hope that your your children take to heart. What do you hope that really people when people define so you? So I what, think what probably yeah. So far, because it's not been long. Um so far it's just standing and winning elections. Um and and I think, you know, when I'm when I'm walking around my constituency, when I'm talking to my constituents, really matters to them that they've got somebody who they feel properly represents them. Not every single one, you know, there are plenty of, of constituents who'd rather have a Tory MP, but, um, you know, and at the point when I won the 2016 by-election, uh, uh, the Brexit vote had just happened. Trump had just been elected in um, in America, which I think was, was quite material. Um, and people just felt that politics and the government and the way everything was going was sort of sliding away from where they wanted it to be. So to be the per, so there was a lot of people actually really grateful uh, to have someone who they felt shared their values standing up for them. Um, mm-hmm. Outside of Richmond Park, lots of people took a lot of heart from the from the victory. So I think both that and then winning again in twenty nineteen, and losing only so narrowly, uh, less high profile. As well. Yeah. yeah. How do you, yes, how did you deal with that? I'm sorry to bring up bad memories, but it was so close. No, no, no. And... no. It it was it was. I mean, I the fact that it was so close made it less bad, if you know what I mean. It wasn't mm-hmm. like a you know a really devastating loss. And I think for me, because I'd been a, a, an MP for such a short time, it wasn't difficult for me to sort of pick up the threads of what I had been doing and and um, pick up my life from before. Uh, go back to being. I was working as an accountant before I got elected in 2016, and I just went back to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, it didn't feel too yeah. too jarring, but um, it it was kind of also I you know I learned a lot of lessons in that short six month period about because I was so inexperienced when I won that by election, and I really didn't know what it was that that MPs did or and the weird thing about if you're a bit of an outsider to politics because as I say I wasn't I wasn't uh, in student society I hadn't been part of politics you know for most of my adult life. But you, you, you're you really entering a bit of a closed circle. Everybody knows everybody else. Every there's uh, It's quite formulaic political networks, life and everybody yeah. knows what they're doing. And then you're suddenly new. And it's that sort of people don't know what you don't know kind of thing. And they don't bother First to tell day of you. School it's all kind over of again. like, yeah. yeah. But particularly when you're coming in as a by-election winner, you know, it's kind of like everyone else yeah. is established and they know what they're don't doing have and a they're cohort, scurrying yeah. around and everyone else. And you're just like, what am I doing? And so, I, yeah. I you know, I, I learned, I had a very steep learning curve in that first six months. And it was so much better to come back in 2019 and then be able to apply all the things I'd learned and to really get on with it, uh, yeah. becoming, a, you know, being a good MP. So, um, but I think, I definitely think standing in 2016 and winning that by-election so far has probably been the most impactful thing that I've done I will um, I yeah I would just because of the the message that it's sent just because for people who were feeling at that stage that they weren't being represented you know there was a bit of a glimmer of hope uh you know in terms of being able to demonstrate that not everybody felt there have been there have been times sort of post-referendum and post Boris's victory in 2019, where it was kind of like the British people have spoken. This is what they want. Everyone else, shut up. We're just going to do this. And you know, there's some very heavy overinterpretation of both of those results that have been used to justify mm-hmm. all sorts of things that I don't think actually are either in the interests of the country or the wishes of the British people. Um, right. And uh, so, just to be the, you know, a bit of a lone voice standing against that has <laughs> been yeah. satisfying. So, what do you what do you hope to how do you hope to build on your success in the future? If you could um, 
what do you hope that the Lib Dems and yourself personally can spur in the next, in the, well, in the rest of this parliament on the next? Well, our, our focus is very much on the next general election and we hope to make gains. And if we can make sufficient gains that we can be a influential voice in the next parliament, I think is, is very much our goal. Uh, perhaps a coalition seeing, member? Possibly. I'm not, I'm not, it's impossible to speculate. I mean, it's not impossible to speculate, but it's impossible to make any, uh, any kind of firm predictions about what's going to happen. Yeah, after you the did, next, sorry, everything is up in the briefly, air just in the last fortnight. So <laughs> yeah, of course, completely picking up on that with, um, with what's happened mm. to the Conservatives, especially in the last few years since Boris Johnson's mm. election, particularly, and you have urged for cooperative mm. electioneering with Labour in the past. Would you be in favour of this at the next general election? Um, I think to a small degree, I think what doesn't work, and this has been my own experience is standing down candidates. I think we've all got mm -hmm. to stand candidates. Everybody yep. should have the opportunity to express their view by voting for the candidate who best reflects their particular view. And that means standing Lib Dems in, in seats that Labour want to win. And it means Labour standing candidates in seats that Lib Dems Christian want Park. to win. I don't think there can be, yeah, yeah. I don't think there can be any, any suggestion um, of uh, you know, parties not standing candidates anywhere. I think that's that's quite damaging to the parties themselves, and also denies a proper democratic choice. So, and we're not going to. So, we're not going to see anything like that. Um, but you know, all parties have got limited resources. They will be focusing their efforts on the seats that they can win. Um, and I think what we what we might expect to see. Um, particularly, I feel as if the, the you know the sharp turn in the opinion polls over the last couple of weeks has been very much kind of an anti-Tory uh, move. So I think it's in both parties' interest to exploit that kind of anti-Tory mood Sentence, as much yeah, as possible. Maybe. So we'll we'll be looking, I think, not to get in each other's way. You know, who's best place to take a seat? Um, yes. Who's best place to? Um, and then it will be a case of of you know. I don't know to what extent we'll make sure, but I'm assuming it will just happen that we won't be putting our resources into a seat that Labour are trying to win and vice versa. Yeah. Um, and it should be reasonably obvious which seats those are and who's going yeah. for what. I so I, I can see that minutes. happening. I can see that happening. I realise I have a few mm -hmm. minutes left with you and I don't want to take up too much of mm -hmm. your time. I know you're busy being interviewed by the BBC rather than the King's Student Paper, so I don't want to eat into too much of <laughs> your time. I have two <laughs> final questions. Equally um, important. Just basically, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll quote that specifically. Um, I have two final questions yes. based on stuff that you've <laughs> recently been active on, perhaps on Twitter and in, in Parliament. Um, your website advertises that you'd be in favour of the Department for Climate Change to make a more built-up approach. Would you be able to briefly summarise what that would really offer to the country in the fight against global warming? What to reinstitute a department? Yeah, so we had a department for climate change during the last Labour government, during the coalition government, and then it was scrapped by the Tories in 2015. One of the things I notice uh, as we're trying to advocate for to go faster and further um, on the government's net zero uh, promises is that it's so um, disintegrated across different uh, departments. There's a department for housing, department for transport, department for agriculture, department for um, uh, uh, housing, you know, they've all got different parts to play in uh, in net zero. They've got to kind of work with each other in order to achieve those, but there isn't anything. So we don't have a minister sitting in the middle who's really pushing that forward uh, and who is who is uh, coordinating all of that activity and could be an imp a, a person almost as important as the chancellor is what we need. So where yes. the chancellor is setting budgets and, and providing the spending priorities, we need someone of equal stat stature looking at the carbon uh, maybe what Alok Sharma was and, doing and, and, at, the, at the last COP yeah maybe I mean Alok like Sharma I've got some time for him he he's got it he's grasped what's required but he's really quite marginal within the cabinet um, and mm -hmm. we need an Alok Sharma with a more central role um, and but it's it's not just Alok Sharma it's like the prime minister has to yeah. you know uh, identify the importance of that role and make sure that that person is given the powers they need to push the agenda across government the moment everyone's getting in each other's way or they're pretending it's somebody else's problem or that they only need to do this small bit and it's just not joined up and it's really frustrating okay yeah, thank you for that um you have recently tweeted just two days ago so Saturday while you were doing the meet up with your um, with your former King's <laughs> colleagues actually, that you issued an open letter to the Department of Work and Pensions about mortgage support in the face of spiraling rates which yeah. hit 6% after the announcement yeah. I am actually meeting and interviewing yeah. Alex Burghardt the Parliamentary Undersecretary of the Department of ah, Work and Pensions yeah. in the next few weeks what should I ask yeah. him from you 
<laughs> Goodness knows what's happening over the next few weeks. And I think for the DWP, their primary concern is going to be, are they going to uprate benefits in line with inflation or, or with prices? Uh, but what? But they, they, the, the technical thing on SMI, support for mortgage interest, is that they changed it from uh, a grant to a loan uh, back in 2018, I think. Um, and then they also extended the waiting period. So I can't remember exactly. I think it went from uh, it went from something like six weeks to three months or something like that. Um, but the point is, we're going to have an awful lot more people in need of assistance. You know, and and the the options are either they get assistance with paying their mortgages, or they're made homeless, and then it's up to their local authority to to find them homes. And there'll be overwhelmingly families with young children who are going to be struggling. So it makes sense. Um, because the government have already got this mechanism to support mortgage payers who find themselves in difficulties. It makes sense to reverse the changes they made in 2018 so that it can be accessed by a wider range of uh, of borrowers because otherwise it's – and I, I have a particular concern about this. Richmond Park has one of the highest, uh, highest numbers of mortgage payers of any constituency in the country. Um, and yes, a lot of my constituents are very wealthy, but – house prices are high and they, they pay an awful lot of their salary in mortgages. And so if they're finding that suddenly the, the interest rate is going up by more than they can afford, I'm going to find a lot of constituents in a very difficult position. And, you know, sort of middle income, high income constituents are going to really, really struggle. So uh, it's absolutely essential that the government prepares to make some proper adequate provision. If, you know, if this if if interest rates come down again, then this is just a short, a small storm that we need to weather. Um, but in the meantime, people are going to need support. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, just in one sentence, if you could offer Liz Truss one genuine piece of advice in a phrase, what would that be? A sound bite, so to speak. <sighs> Listen to good advice. <laughs> Listen mm -hmm. to people who know what they're talking about. Listen to people who've got some experience of the real world. Listen to people who've got experience in implementing policy. Uh, know the pitfalls. Understand, you know, who who understand what it is that you're trying to achieve. But for goodness sake, listen to people who uh, who have, you know, real world experience in either the impact of the policy or the best way to implement things. Because I just feel like She's come in, she's taken control of the levers, but she's just, I don't know, she and Kwasi Kwarteng just seem to have implemented a load of policies that they've thought about, they've written some papers about, they've had intellectual discussions about, but no real contact with the real world, either, yes. you know, how well the policies are going to be received or how easy they are to implement. And their, their mini budget has just been such a disaster and an experienced, you know, independent uh, official such as Tom Scholar, who she sacked, could have told her that you know what the impact on the money markets was likely to be, and then what the knock-on impact for mortgage holders and and so on would be. So, um, I just think there's a number of massive errors there that if she just listened to people who knew what they were talking about. Uh, we would all have been better off, <laughs> let's face it. Right. Well, um, thank you very much for your time. I know I've overrun by a few minutes, but um, could not you at all. On your That's thanks? fine personally uh, to Theo from me please because he spent a lot of time uh, trying to coordinate yes, this and he's been amazing so no problem much. I hope to see you around in Absolutely. the future maybe if you, if another published... one of these yes well ha mm. hanging around on the South Bank <laughs> yes exactly if you could send us a copy of your article once you've uh, once you've had it of course. published that and would be any, great any, any snippets that uh, the media team get their claws into I'll make sure they check with you before <laughs> yeah perfect Brilliant. thank you very much have a great day and all right then thank you bye. and you thank you bye 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 bye, bye.